Amen. So James chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, the Bible reads, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the, whole, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So what James is saying, of course, this is a, a passage that you would turn to when you're talking about the tongue and, and the use of the mouth and things like that. But that's not really the direction I'm going to go this morning. In fact, uh, this might take you by surprise. It's, it's kind of a different sermon. It's not something I've heard you know, a whole sermon dedicated to, but kind of in light of things that have been going on, I, I thought it'd be uh, appropriate, and that is the sin of arson, the sin of arson. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I turn to James chapter 3 because he's saying there in verse 5, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. In a previous uh, verse, he talked about how a, uh, a ship is turned about by a very small helm. And how something so small, behold how great a matter, as it says in James 5, uh, can, uh, a little fire kindleth. And of course, every great fire that has ever been started, it started out as just a simple flame, maybe even just a spark. That's how every great big uh, fire has ever taken place. No fire just, you know, is immediately uh, just this giant problem. So what he's saying there is, you know, a small member creates big problems. Even so, you know, the greatest of fires has begun by just a small spark. So I wanted to turn there just to use that analogy that James used about a fire spreading and become something very big when talking about the sin of arson this morning and it's it's I don't know that it's a coincidence um, I certainly didn't have anything to do with it but I didn't know if you noticed this morning that Mount Lemon is actually on fire right now so I'm driving down here this on the 10 and I look and I think well that's nice what a perfect illustration for my sermon meanwhile just you know hundreds of acres thousands of acres burning up hopefully it doesn't get over into people's homes and things like that I didn't have anything to do with that okay all right I didn't come down here to you know set that intentionally and just just for a sermon's sake all right but, uh, you know, I did think that was interesting. But that's the kind of thing we see happening all the time. Now, whether or not that was arson, I don't know. That could have been a lightning strike. Some, something could have gotten out of hand. Who knows? I'm sure they'll get to the bottom of it. But the sin of arson is something that the Bible does talk about. It's something that we, we see a lot of examples of arson in the Bible. And, uh, you know, it's something that we have to deal with in our world. In fact, uh, I was just going to read to you here for a minute uh, some statistics. You know, and I know that statistics sometimes when a preacher starts going on, can get kind of dry and you know uh, but stick with me okay and I'll try to make it as exciting as I can but remember what we're talking about we're talking about arson this morning okay the, de the criminal act of deliberately setting fire to property somebody going and maliciously trying to destroy the property of others by setting it on fire that's what ar arson is and the FBI has uh, just some statistics here going back to 2017. I really couldn't find a lot of stats on this. But, you know, this gives us a, a general idea of why arson, you know, is something that, you know, could stand to be preached about and against. It says in 2017, law enforcement agencies reported 41,171 arsons in the United States. 41,000. You would think, you know, arson, I, and yeah, it happens, but does it happen that, ha that often? Well, it happened over 40,000 times in 2017, according to a lot of these law enforcement agencies. So it's something that takes, takes place quite a bit. Uh, the average dollar loss per arson, okay? So they took those 40 plus thousand cases of arson and they determined how much money was, how much uh, you know, money was lost, how much monetary damage was uh, suffered, you know, and they added it all up and they, they averaged it out, okay? That came to $15,573. So the average case of arson comes to fifteen thousand dollars you think well that's i mean that's a significant amount of money you know uh if you don't believe me cut me a check for fifteen thousand and look at my face but <laughs> here's the thing you know uh, arson we often think about just buildings right we just think about large buildings getting set on fire things like that but it also includes cars so you know that might bring that number down a little bit because you have a lot of people just you know somebody wins a championship or somebody wins some stupid sports game and what's that what do they do they go out and they set cars on fire in the streets to celebrate you know I don't think the owner of that car is that excited you know they might even maybe they were even rooting for the same team but when they come out the next morning to go to work and find their car you know uh, just a crispy critter with no rent you know no tires on it they're probably not going to be that excited so maybe that's part of why that number is a little bit lower I was anticipating to be much higher 
But arson of industrial and manufacturing structures uh, resulted in the highest average dollar loss, and this is where it climbs up when he started getting into industrial manufa manufacturing structures. And they averaged to $54,500. So you can see how that goes up. Now, of course, you would say, who would light a building on fire? Well, you know, there are, we're going to look at some people today who are just, you know, uh, they're, they're not right in the head, you know, basically, and they're, they, they are just wicked people that light fires. But people also do it in terms of theft. You know, there's, there's what's called insurance fraud. And then, you know, insurance companies have a whole team of people that will go out in instances of fire where a claim is being made on the loss of, of, of a building or whatever, and they'll examine you know, they'll get with the fire department and they'll study what happened and they'll look at the person's bank statements and see if they had any motive to do this. And a lot of times they do find out that it wasn't just uh, accidental, that in fact somebody intentionally lit a fire just so they could get an insurance claim. Which really isn't that hard to believe when we have people today that are throwing themselves in front of cars to get insurance claims. Have you seen this? Where they're just, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of walk in front of your car and they just jump up on the hood and be like, oh, you hit me. You know, and then you got to get the dash cam and everything. So people are into this kind of thing that, you know, f you know, stealing, committing fraud. And one way they do it is through arson. Arson had gone up 1.7% from 2016 to 2017. Nationwide, there were 13.3 arsons, uh, uh, arson offenses for every 100,000 inhabitants. <clears throat> how about this? Why would I preach about arson? Well, how about because some of the current events we've seen? just in these last couple of weeks, this last week or so, all the different riots that we were seeing take place all over the country. You know, we could even look back into history. And let me tell you something, when you study the riots of the past, these kids today don't know how to do it. I mean, they're weak. It's weak sauce. They should look back. I mean, you want to get serious about some riots, go back to the Detroit riots back in 1967, where 43 people were dead, 342 people were injured, 2,509 businesses reported looting or damage, 388 families were rendered homeless or displaced, and 412 buildings were burned or damaged enough to be demolished. So people are just like, I mean, the Detroit riots were, were, I mean, they got to the point where they actually had to call in the Army National Guard and start shooting people to get them to stop looting and burning, uh, you know, their own homes and businesses down. The dollar losses from that riot went from, were estimated from, from 40 to $45 million. That's back in 1967. That's a lot of money, especially back then. You know, and, uh, and then you could talk about the next, uh, the, the two years previous, the LA and LA, the Watts riots, right? Those were another one where they had 34 deaths. They had uh, 40 million in property damage. And, but you know, today this would apply, we could think about the fact that arson is a sin when we see these George Floyd riots taking place. Now, let me just clarify that I think what happened to George, uh, George Floyd was an atrocity and that those men should be punished. Those officers that are involved should be and are going to court and they're going to be tried and I think that they should be punished uh, appropriately. But that is no excuse to, to, see, to, 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 uh, to see what we see taking place today. Now, I'm all for protests. I mean, I, I think people should be able to exercise their, their freedom of speech. And if people want to assemble somewhere, you know, during the day in a place that makes sense and express their, their, uh, you know, their uh, disapproval of the things that are happening in our government, by all means, do so. But when people are assembling at night, you know, late at night in shopping areas, that's not a protest. That's just rioting. Okay. And there's a difference there. And hopefully we all understand that. And we see this taking place. That's what these George Floyd, they, these aren't the George Floyd protests. These are, you know, there are protests, of course, but we've also seen a lot of rioting, you know, and of course we all have to deal with it now because of the fact that there's a curfew that's been issued. You know, they finally let us outdoors after the COVID-19 and now it's like, you could come out, but only for a little while. Now you got to go back home at eight o'clock. <coughs> so these things affect us. You know, I didn't light any fires. I didn't throw any bricks. I haven't looted anything. There's no new, there's no, you know, brand new giant appliance in my house. You know, I, I don't have any fresh duds on or anything like that. <coughs> but we do see these riots taking place. And what happens in a lot of these riots is there's fire. Now, thankfully here in Arizona, the fires haven't gotten that out of control. But in places, I believe it was in Minneapolis, isn't that where it first started? Is that right? Minneapolis? 
I mean, they're burning entire, you know, department store, Target, you know, AutoZone just burned to the ground. You know, all the loss of the merchandise and the structures and the jobs and everything else. You know, here in Tucson, the, they, they worked up to a dumpster fire. I think they, like, maybe a trash barrel or something like that. Which really isn't that bright when you're living in a city in the middle of a desert. I mean, everything's dry. You know, it's just not a good idea to be lighting fires. So the sin of arson is what we're talking about this morning. And of course, you know, this would is something that we need to talk about because of the fact that we've seen it in the past, you know, in, in the form of riots. And even in our, in, you know, as late as this last week, people are doing this type of thing. <coughs> and that's probably where most people's minds go when we talk about arson is the riots. But a lo another form of arson that we see often is in the form of wildfires. A lot of wildfires are lit intentionally and they blaze out of control. And even those, you know, we could talk about all the fires in California that have taken place. And you could see the devastation uh, that, that takes place when fires just rage out of control and just burn people's houses to the ground. If you would, go over to 2 Samuel chapter 14. 2 Samuel chapter 14. So wildfire arson is the felony act of maliciously setting fire to wild lands, uncultivated land, comprised of forest, brush, or grassland, according to the U.S. Fire Administration. Not only does wildfire arson destroy natural lands, but it devastates a significant number of buildings, homes, and other property, in addition to taking lives of firefighters and residents. You know, and that's something that we're familiar with here in Arizona. Uh, what was that? I, I forget. When I first moved here, it was a real big deal. They, they lost several uh, of these, these firefighters out on this... I think it was Iron Mountain. Does everyone, anyone want to, no one knows what I'm talking about. They lost several firefighters. I believe it was on Iron Mountain. I could have that wrong. <coughs> you know, it's just, I'm just now recalling it, but, you know, men that are going out risking their lives to try to protect people's homes and property from, to keep a fire from raging out of control, you know, they're going out and they're losing their lives. Now, whether or not that one was malicious or not, whether that one was arson, I don't know. But there have been people that have set fires deliberately you know, on wildfires, just gone out into some natural national forest or wherever and just lit a fire and then it spreads and it starts to threaten people's homes and men have to go out and fight this fire and sometimes they don't come back. <coughs> so you can see how arson is a, is a sin, you know, because it's malicious. You know, not only is it going to cost people money, but it could actually end up costing people their very lives. Needless to say, wildfire arson is no small threat. Six of the 20 most damaging wildfires in California, in terms of structures destroyed, were by arson. So six of the 20 most damaging wildfires were caused, excuse me, by arson. Let me throw some more stats at you. Georgia records an average of 700, 700 arson fires, destroying over 9,000 acres annually. That's every year. Arson fires, 700 arson fires every year year, destroying thousands, 9,000 acres annually. It's crazy. I had no idea that kind of thing even was going on. Is it really that? It's a bigger problem, I think, than most people realize. At least it is in Georgia. I don't know what's going on over there. If there's something in the, in the water or the air or what, but people are just lighting fires. It's a bunch of pyros over there. And over 240 wildfires, no offense if you're from Georgia, by the way, I'm sure, you know, just turn in your matches or something. But it says, and 240 wildfires were caused by arson in Florida. Now you'd think it'd be hard to catch anything on in that giant, uh, catch on fire in that giant swamp over there, but they managed to do it. Wildfires were caused by uh, 240 and, uh, between January 1st and April 14th. That's just in a stretch of a few months. Of the 58 most destructive wildfires in U.S. history, 16 are confirmed arson fires, almost 28%. So over a quarter of the most destructive arson fires in this country's history, history were lit on purpose by somebody just being malicious. These devastating 16 fires destroyed almost 6,500 structures, homes, businesses, etc. They killed 50 people and burned nearly 1 million acres. <coughs> so there's 50 people that, you know, could, you know, lived, you know, lived out their days if somebody hadn't lit a fire. <coughs> and, you know, I want to get into it. You know, why is arson a sin? I think just the facts here are enough for us to say, you know, arson is not, you know, it's not a laughing matter. I mean, I'm not kind of joking here because it's kind of a different topic. But here's the thing, you know, arsonists are wicked people at the end of the day. A person who would go out and intentionally light a fire 
is a wicked person. Knowing this could damage somebody's home, this could ruin somebody's business, this is, you know, this could, you know, cost somebody their livelihood. This could cost somebody their life. But hey, I, you know, for my cheap entertainment, for my, uh, you know, just to get some kicks, I'm going to go ahead and light a fire. It's wicked. <clears throat> look there in 2 Samuel chapter 14. Let's look at some of the people that lit fires in the Bible. Verse 28. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem. So we all know Absalom, right? <clears throat> Absalom was the one who eventually uh, rebelled against his father, King David, and he was a wicked man. It says that he dwelt, and this is when he is returning after having killed his half-brother over the, the affair with uh, Tamar, the, the rape that had taken place there. I don't want to get into all the backstory, but here comes Absalom. He's in Jerusalem full two years and saw not the king's face. Therefore Absalom sent for Joab <clears throat> to have sent him to the king. To, him to the king. So he's saying, look, I want you, I'm trying, he's trying to get a hold of Joab because he wants Joab to bring him to the king so that he can see his dad, King David, once more. <coughs> uh, look at verse 30. Uh, excuse me, we'll continue on in verse 29. It says, but he would not come to him. And when he was sent to him again the second time, he would not come. So he's sending for Joab, he's sending for Joab, and Joab's not coming. He's ignoring him. So what would be the reasonable response? Just keep bugging him? I don't know, maybe send a uh, a, you know, an edible arrangement, you know, a fruit basket. Maybe try to woo him over, you know. Maybe try to, you know, win him with uh, your, and get into his good graces. Is that Absalom's approach? You know, trying to catch more flies with honey than vinegar? No. <coughs> it says in verse 30, Therefore he said to his servants, servants, See Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there. Go set it on fire. Go and just light his field on fire. That'll get his attention. Then he'll hear what I have to say. This guy is a malicious person, and he's careless. He's reckless. Notice it says that it was near mine. So he's even risking his own property. I mean, this thing could have spread and gotten out of control. Now, this is back when they didn't, you know, they didn't have, you know, the, the big fire trucks and the hoses and hydrants on every corner. I mean, it would have been a big deal if this thing got out of control. I mean, you probably, back then, the only thing you probably just do is wait for it to rain. And just hope that, you know, that would put it out. <laughs> and Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then jo uh, Joab arose and stopped, dropped, and rolled, right? He arose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? You know, and he's probably expecting a real good reason why that took place. I mean, there's got to be a reason behind this. And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king. <laughs> that's it. He's like, well, you were ignoring. I kept sending to you. You know, I left voicemails. I sent you some emails, and you just weren't you just weren't replying. So natural. Well, I mean, what what'd you expect? Of course, I'm going to come light your field on fire. You know, this is and then you know, th and we could talk about a lot of other things with the, you know this this kind of you know vindictive, malicious attitude that sometimes people can get when they're being ignored. Okay, maybe they're not going to light a field on fire, but they could do other things. Okay. But I don't want to get into all that. But, you know, Absalom, he wasn't just, you know, going to give Joab the cold shoulder. You know, <laughs> that was a pun without even meaning to, right? The cold shoulder. He, he was going to heat things up, right? He was going to get it hot over there. He said, I'm going to light your field on fire. You're going to take notice of me. You're going to know I'm upset. Well, that makes, you know, Absalom's a wicked person. You know what And Absalom was? He was a rebel. You know, he's this guy who just disdains the authority, disdains the powers that be, and, you know, rebels against the king, right? And is that, is, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that we see the same thing with these rioters. You know, and you can have whatever opinion you want about, about the police. And, you know, people want to, it's like become this edgy thing, I guess, now to start talking about whether or not the police should or should not be. But whatever your opinion is about the cops, let me just go ahead and, yeah, and clue you in on something. They're not going anywhere. So you might as well just go ahead and adjust your attitude accordingly because the cops are here to stay until Jesus comes, all right? And what do we see people who have a problem with that do? I mean, not everyone, obviously, that has a problem with the cops is going to be an arsonist. But it, it's no coincidence that the very people you see, you know, rising up, defying the curfews, uh, gathering in places they're not told to gather late at night and getting into all kind of criminal mischief are rebels that are lighting fires. Because arsonists are wicked, rebellious people. Not only that, arsonists, they're very vengeful and very ang angry people at times. Go over to Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. You're going to Judges 15. 
I'll remind you the story in Judges uh, chapter 12, and it says, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore thou passest thou over to fight against the children of Amnon and did not call us to go with thee? So if you remember the story of Jephthah, they asked him to go deliver them from the, from these, uh, <coughs> uh, the children of Amnon. They're being oppressed. And eventually he goes over and fights this battle and he comes back. And he's the guy that he sac you know, opened his mouth and swore to the Lord that he would sacrifice the first thing that came out unto him from his house when he returned in safety. And it was his daughter and he ended up following through on that. You know, that's the backstory. But, you know, then, then these, you know, so he does that. And then these guys show up and they say, hey, why, why, why weren't we invited? And did not call us to go with thee. And what was their response? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. You know, we're so upset about this. We're so angry. We're so vengeful. We're so wicked that we're going to go ahead and just burn your house with you in it. So we see that arsonists are wicked people. They're vengeful people and they're angry people often. Look there in Judges chapter 15. The story of Samson. Now, Samson obviously was a righteous man. Samson is in the hall of faith. Samson is a man that did great works for God. He judged Israel. But Samson uh, also had a lot of drawbacks. You know? and, and Samson was a man of like passions like as we are. So I'm not, gonna, you know, I'm not trying to just bag on Samson. But you know, Samson's in that. We have the stories of Samson for a reason. And a lot of it is so we can learn what not to do. Okay, Because Samson made a lot of mistakes in his life, didn't he? And we could talk about the life of Samson's. Well, one of them was, uh, you know, after he'd gotten married to the Philistine woman and he was displeased because she revealed the riddle unto, unto the Philistines there and he left her. And it says in verse one, but it came to pass within after a while in the time of harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. So he said, I'm going to go back and pay her a visit. I, and he said, and I will go in uh, to my wife uh, into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go in. And his father said, Very, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her. They, therefore I gave her uh, to thy companion. So uh, is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So you can see, you know, the set of morals these, these heathen Philistines have. These are pretty wicked people. He says, Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said concerning them, Now I shall be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. You know, we could talk about the fact that it's, it's nice that Samson thinks that, but that's not always the case, is it? He's trying to justify himself. You know, he's saying, Look, they offended me, now I'm going to offend them, and that'll be the end of it. And we know the story of Samson that it just continually escalates. And it says in verse 4, And Samuel went, uh, Samson rather, went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands, and turned tail to tail, and put a firebrand in the midst between the two tails, and we had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines, and burnt up the shocks, and also the standing corn, with the vineyards and the olives. So Samson, you know, amongst many other things that he was, good and bad, was an arsonist. <laughs> it's true. I mean, what else is this? What else could you possibly call this? God's righteous indignation? I don't think so. This now points for creativity. Okay, I mean, I mean, I'm looking. I read the story. I'm like, good night. Have you ever heard of wood? You know, have you ever heard? Just rub some sticks together, Samson, and just you know, throw the fire out there, and it'll do just fine. He takes the time to catch 300 foxes. I don't know that I've seen more than three foxes in my entire life in the wild. You know, very nocturnal animal. I'm always impressed by the story. That part of it. That's one of the most. You know, we, a lot of all of the great feats that Samson did. You know, we, we were impressed by it. That's when we kind of gloss over. The man went and caught 300 foxes. Now, I don't know if he was setting up traps or whatever, but, man, he's catching these foxes and, and 300 of them. And I don't know how long that you'd think, you know, that would have been like the cool down, the, the California cool down period. You know, when you, when you buy a gun, you got to wait 10 days or whatever to cool down. I mean, he mu you'd think if you were taking the time to catch 300 foxes, you'd probably be like, wait a minute, this probably isn't a good idea. Uh, you know, let me just calm down here. You know, I'm, I'm at fault here. I think he caught them pretty quick. I think he caught these foxes or he was just so determined to make this happen. But he writes this firebrand. He ties them tail to tail, right? And he puts his fire and just turns them loose. And it's just like, good night. Have, have you not heard of a weed burner? Do you not know how to just start a regular fire like a normal person? But it's, he's kind of, I think he's kind of flexing a little bit. Yeah, I lit your field on fire and I used foxes to do it. <laughs> you know, he's kind of just... Trying to show off a little bit. It's like, come on, Samson. When you really, I mean, after everything else you've done, you really got to show off like that. But I'm always impressed with that. Now, albeit what he did was wrong. I believe that. He had no business just lighting somebody's field on fire. I mean, was it, 
was it just her, you know, was it his father-in-law's field that he let him fire? No, it was, uh, it was the Philistines' fields that he set on fire. And they were wicked people, so on and so forth. But he, he does all this uh, and, and, and makes him an arsonist. And what was he? He was an angry person at this story point in his life. You know, he was just trying to be vengeful. He was just trying to get back. So you can see that, you know, when we see, look at the scripture and see arson being committed, it's being committed by wicked people. It's being committed by rebels. It's being committed by people who are vengeful and angry. So there's never, you know, a good reason to commit arson, okay? <laughs> Unless you're the Lord, all right? When you, when you light the whole world on fire to purge it of the iniquity, then I suppose that's okay. But, you know, his ways are higher than our ways. He can, he can, it's his, right? He can go ahead. It's, not, it's only malicious when you're lighting somebody else's property on fire. You know, the earth is the Lord's, you know, so he can go ahead and light it on fire whenever he wants. <coughs> and he is going to do that one day. But not only that, but, uh, you know, arsonists are all these things, but what I want to kind of close here on this morning is the fact that arsonists are deeply disturbed people often. And more so in our modern day, when we look at people who are notorious arsonists, they're very wicked and very disturbed individuals, psychopaths, reprobates often. So if you'd look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, go to 1 Kings chapter 16. I'm going to read you about the story here in First King, uh, about Zimri in 1 Kings chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 8 of 1 Kings 16. It says, In the twentieth and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah the son of Baasha to reign over Tizra two years. And his servant uh, Zimri, captain of the half of his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Azra, Arza, steward of his house in Terza. So here's this guy, Zimri, he's captain of the half of this man's chariots, and he ends up conspiring against him. Okay, so again, what do we have? We have a rebellious person. Okay, and it says in verse 10, And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the twentieth and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah's, uh, that, and reigned in his stead. So he takes the throne from him by conspiracy and murder. In verse 11, And it came to pass when he began to reign, as soon as he was sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasha, and that he left not one that pisseth against the wall, neither of his kinsfolks nor of his friends. Thus did Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. Now again, here's something, just a side note. This is worth pointing out, okay? And I mentioned this on Thursday night when we were going through 1 Samuel chapter 4, is that God uses wicked people to accomplish his will. Zimri was a wicked man, and God used him to punish uh, this, this, king, uh, this king here, uh, Asa. That's a whole other story in of itself. <coughs> and it says in verse 13, For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, which he had, they had sinned, and which they had made uh, Israel to sin, and provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah, all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Verse 15, In the twentieth and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, did Zimri begin to reign in Terza. And the people were encamped against Gibeathan, against, uh, which belongeth to the Philistines. And the people that were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired, and hath also slain the king. Wherefore all Israel made Amri, the captain of the host, king over Israel that day in the camp. And Amri went up from Gibeathan uh, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Terza. And it came to pass, verse 18, when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he sees, he sees his end coming. Okay, they find, find out what he's doing. They make their own king, and they're going up to clean house. They're going to go up to punish Zimri. So not only that, God uses wicked people, but then he also punishes those wicked people. But that's another story. And it came to pass, when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died. So again, you see a very disturbed person here. Somebody, I mean, I don't know what they were planning to do to this guy, but I can't imagine that, that burning to death is the most pleasant way to go. You know, maybe the, hopefully you, you die of the officiation or whatever before you, you actually light on fire, but I mean, he, he's a disturbed individual to think, well, I'm going to commit suicide. Let me light myself on fire. Let me burn this house down upon me. Very disturbed guy, okay? And what else do we see in his life? He's rebellious. Right? He's, he's, a, he's a conspirator. He's a wicked man. And he's very disturbed as well. But uh, I want to just read to you some actual, uh, if you would go over to Exodus chapter 22, but let's read about some modern day arsonists. We've looked at several in the Bible. And I think just from that alone, we can see that, you know, what people that are committing arson are in sin. That arsony is a sin this morning. And it's one that's kind of, you know, plagued our country to a certain degree. 
Is it the worst thing that's going? I mean, is it the most prevalent sin that we, we find in our country today? No, but it is a sin that we find in our world nonetheless, and it needs to be preached against. And I'm going to read to you some stories about some face, famous arsonists, okay? So stay with me. How about the story of John Orr? Okay, John Orr was a former fire captain and arson investigator for the Glendale Fire Department in Southern California. So here you have this guy who his living was fighting and investigating fires. And he turns out to be an arson. During the 80s and uh, early 90s, there was a series of fires around LA that were going unsolved. Investigators noticed that the fires were started in areas next to major highways and ironically, while arson investigation conventions were going on nearby. So this, you can see how this guy's trying to get his kicks. He's lighting fires near these conventions where there's arson investigation conferences taking place. Right? So he goes on and he says here, uh, during the investigation, police discovered an important piece of information, a fingerprint and a time delay incinerary device uh, from the 1987 fire in Fresno, California. The fingerprint was linked to arson investigator John Orr. In addition to the fingerprint evidence and seized accelerating devices belonging to Orr, there was an earlier incident that sparked suspicion. Orr was one of the arson investigators assigned to a 1984 South Pasadena fire that destroyed a hardware store, killing four people. All of the arson investigators agreed that the cause was an electrical fire, but Orr insisted that it was arson. Orr con was convicted and charged with three accounts of arson and is currently serving in, in life prison, uh, a life in prison. So before they bust him, they had already had their suspicions because of this fact when he burned this hardware store to the ground, the investigators gets, ca came to the wrong conclusion. And they said, oh, it was electrical. He's, no, it was arson. No, it was arson. Hey, it was arson. I, he was almost wanted to say, I did it. You know? What he's trying to do is get credit you know, for what he had done, you know, whether or not indirectly, albeit, but he wanted people to recognize that there was an arsonist on the loose. And it's because he's proud, you know, why would a fire investigator and, uh, and, and a fireman, a captain of a fire department be like, uh, get involved in this kind of thing? Why would you turn out to be an arson? You know, be, because there's something wrong with your head. Because you're, there's something seriously uh, wrong with you. You're a disturbed individual. Paul Keller is one of the most notorious serial arsonists in American history. The Seattle man is responsible for at least 70 fires and three deaths in and around Seattle during the 80s and 90s, with unsolved cases even popping up in recent years. This polished-looking advertising salesman and active churchgoer was ruthlessly setting fires to homes, churches, businesses throughout four countries, making this one of the worst serial arsons, uh, arson cases in state history. Finally, in 1993, Killer was found and sentenced to 99 years in prison. You know, that's not the proper punishment. When you're killing people with fire, you are a murderer and deserve to be put to death, according to Scripture. Julio Gonzalez, a Cuban immigrant, was responsible for setting fire to the Happy Land nightclub in Bronx, New York, in 1990, which killed 87 people. Now, this guy was not a serial arsonist. Okay, this is the one thing he did, but he killed 87 people. And I want you to pay attention as to why he ended up doing this. Why does a guy just all of a sudden decide to go light a, built a nightclub on fire and kill 87 people? The night of the fire, Gonzalez was thrown out of Happy Land, you know, the ir ironic name there, after getting into a fight with his girlfriend who worked there. So he's, he's getting in a fight with his girlfriend who's a bartender or a waitress at this nightclub. Gonzalez returned to the nightclub intoxicated. He's drunk. Okay? He doesn't have his senses. He's not thinking. And that should be a warning right there. You know, when you drink alcohol, you become very uninhibited. So you start to think, you, you might start end up doing things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Like, oh, I don't know, light a nightclub on fire? Do you think this guy would have done that if he was sober? I really don't think he would. I mean, maybe he was that kind of an individual, but I think that was a big part of it. The fact that he went out and got drunk and thought, well, this will teach her. You know, this will show her. He poured a can of gasoline along the club's only stairway and, l and started the fire. Most victims were trampled or suffered from as as uh, asphyxiation. Gonzalez was charged with 174 counts of murder. And, you know, it just goes to show you, that how the, you know, what, what's going on in New York. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. 25 years to life for killing 174 people. <coughs> 
known, uh, known for using fire to spread their message. And this one's kind of funny. I included this one because it's, it shows you the depth of the liberal mind, okay? Knowing, this is, this is a, uh, a story about the uh, e eco-terrorist group ELF, the Earth Liberation Front, ELF. And their motto and their mascot literally was like a little green elf. Not kidding. Known for using fire to spread their message against exploitation and destruction of the environment. This is what they're, this is what they're protesting, the destruction of the environment. Okay? The irony, the eco-terrorist group named ELF caused millions of dollars in damage by setting fires around the world. In 1998, ELF caused two, 12 million, excuse me, 12 million in damage at Vail, Colorado by setting, fart, setting fire to part of the ski resort. So it was getting, they were getting ready to s expand this, a ski resort. Ah! You know, talk about snowflakes. I mean, they're, they're upset that someone's gonna chop down a tree, which you can grow another one, hello. And they're all upset, you know, that they're gonna be, you know, imposing upon, you know, the, the wildlife or whatever, so people go skiing. Whatever, you, you can go ahead and have an opinion about that. And you can go ahead and say, well, I, I don't agree. They shouldn't be, you know, you could take your, your cause up against corporate greed all you want. But when you go and light the thing on fire and cause millions of dollars of damage, and the, 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 the irony that they think that that's actually going to change anything. As if that's going to, people are going to go, oh, you're right. Now that you've lit everything on fire, I see the light, you know, figuratively and literally, right? Yeah, what were we thinking? Thank you for bringing us to our senses by just burning our entire business to the ground. I appreciate you. But the real irony is, is that they're burning this, right? And they're, they're, <laughs> they're an environmental protection agency that's, destroy, that, that's protesting the destruction of the earth and then they're lighting fires and they're releasing all that carbon monoxide and whatever, the smoke into the atmosphere, you know, and, and do they not realize they're just gonna cut down more trees and have more buildings, you know, lumber come in and building supplies? I thought that was kind of ironic. I mean, it's, we can laugh at it because it wasn't our ski resort, but, and I don't go to Vail very often, <laughs> in fact, never. Right? But, uh, you know, I thought it was funny, so I threw that one in there. Now, here's one that's not quite so funny. And the point I'm trying to make here is that arsony is a sin, and that arsonists, you know, in the Bible have been tip are typically are vengeful, angry, rebellious people, quite often. And, you know, what we're reading about here is that, you know, what we're seeing from real life examples is that not only are they rebels, but they're also very disturbed individuals. There was another story about another fireman who also wanted who lit fires for over the course of two years until they found out it was an actual fireman that was doing it. But how about this name? Let's see who recognizes this name. David Berkowitz. Who recognizes David? We got one. We got one taker. Okay, a couple guys. David Berkowitz. Who knows this name? Son of Sam. Probably know that one, right? Maybe not. He was a serial killer who was responsible for killing six people and injuring several others in New York City from 1976 to 1977. Berkowitz is most infamously remembered for murdering women but his destructive behavior first began by setting fires throughout the city. So before he committed his first murder, before he turned into this infamous son of Sam, he was an arsonist. Uh, in an attempt, he was, he was uh, uh, setting fires uh, to buildings in an attempt to vent his anger. One of the fires that Berkowitz set was outside of Craig Glassman's apartment door in which firemen found 22 caliber shells in the ashes that didn't get hot enough to set off. So he goes down on his, and this guy was actually, Glassman lived directly underneath Berkowitz and was a recipient of his hate mail, which was actually evidence that they used to, to link into the Son of Sam later. But so he's going down to his neighbor that lives below him out on his patio and lighting a fire and throwing 22 caliber shells in it, hoping it'll go off and kill or frighten him. And David Berkowitz, we know, went on to be you know, a very disturbed person. So arsony, you know, it, it's a sin, it's something that, only really disturbed people are, are, are doing, you know, and, and, and very vengeful and angry, rebellious people. <coughs> and, uh, you know, that you caught, you know, you say, well, what, how do I apply this this morning? Well, you know, if your child refuses to blow out their candles and the birthday cake, you might want to, you know, seek help. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's the thing. Not all fire setting is arson, okay, in the Bible. Not all fire setting is arson in the Bible, but it is punishable, okay? You're there in Exodus 22? Let's look at an instance where I'm talking about where a fire is lit, but I don't believe this is referring to arson. I believe the biblical punishment for arson would have to depend on what takes place. If a person burns somebody's stuff to the ground, 
and nobody dies, you know, he's going to make restitution be taught much like a thief. He might, you know, four or five fold, he would repay back. If he was an arson and actually killed people, he'd be put to death because, you know, uh, if a man shed a man's blood, by a man's uh, a hand shall, shall a man's blood be shed. I'm totally butchering that. But if you kill somebody, the punishment is death. Exodus chapter 22, look at verse 6. It says, If fire break out and catch in thorns, so that the stack of corn or the standing corn of the field be consumed therewith, he that kindled the fire shall surely make re uh, restitution. So he's saying, look, if it breaks out, okay, because here's the thing, there are things that are called controlled burns. Sometimes you light a fire on purpose. Even people who fight wildfires will do this. They'll light, a, they'll have a controlled burn to burn an area that, you know, while they can still control it, to prevent it from becoming a, a, a bigger disaster later. And even farmers practice this. They'll go out and they'll burn fields and things and so forth. And I believe that's what this is referring to. You're saying, look, if you're burning thorns and, and then it breaks out from that and, it, and, it, and it, uh, it goes to the corn and the standing corn or the field, it gets into somebody's actual farmland and burns up their crops. You know, if you start this controlled burn and you lose control, he that kindled it shall surely make restitution. Like, you're not just going to be like, oh, well, it was an accident. Well, uh, we all know it was an accident. We know you're just trying to clean up your land or whatever, but it happened. Okay, and you still have to make restitution. You can't just say, oops, sorry, because you just burned up somebody's livelihood. Okay? If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, he let him pay double. So it's in that same context of making things right financially, of making restitution for you know, uh, lost property, or in this case, damaged property. Okay? Now, before I close, you know, uh, you know, because I'm trying to make the point here that, you know, not all art, all fire setting is arson, and I have experience with this. All right, I want to share a childhood story. I might have shared it with some of you, but I've actually lit a field on fire when I was younger. And I don't, I'm not saying this, you know, like uh, it's just kind of a funny story. In hindsight, you know, we had this is an example of somebody lighting a fire and not being, t I don't think you would call it arson because it wasn't malicious and it wasn't intentional. But across from my elementary, it's, well, I grew up in Rapid City, South Dakota. We had Horseman Elementary School, then we had the I-90, I think it's the I-90 that goes through there, I don't know, the major interstate that comes through South Dakota on the south side there, and right, and then we, so we had that, the uh, elementary school, the highway, and then there was the overpass, and once you got over there, my grandfather owned like two blocks of land where he had all these rental houses, and right on this side of it, there was a large fielded area that he owned, big field, it had another road that ran by it, and my father and uncle had built a pole barn where they're doing a lot of their, their work there. So after school, me and my buddy would go over there and we found that in this field, there was this culvert. There was like a four foot you know, drainage culvert, that rainwater, just a big concrete culvert that ran underneath the road. And when you're a kid, you know, it's a really cool thing to, it, you, you know, Mario Brothers had just come out, you know, pipes, jumping in pipes and stuff. So we're thinking, hey, it's really cool that we can go in this end and come out the other end on the other side of the road. You know, when you're a kid, that's just fascinating. You know, it's like Ninja Turtle stuff, right? So we go there, and uh, we're going through it. And we're thinking, man, this is cool. We should bring our other friend, Chris. We should bring him over here and show him this tomorrow after school. And my friend Troy is like, well, Chris won't want to do it because it's dark, and he's afraid of the dark. You know, and I'm sure he's gotten over it since then. But we're like, well, let's just bring something to light it up. Now, let's just bring something to show us the way through the tunnel. That was our intent. So what do you think we grabbed? Did we grab a flashlight? No. Would that have made sense? Yes. But remember, we're kids that are fascinated with going through a tunnel in the ground, through a, a dirty old drainage ditch, right? We grab matches, because that's what boys of that age think of. And they're like, oh, matches will work. You know, so we grab matches. And we, so we get Chris after school the next day. We go over there. We got the matches. We're standing at the mouth of this thing in this big you know, field with grass about that tall. And we're like, all right, let's go in. And it's a kind of a windy day. So Troy's lighting the, the, the matches, and they keep blowing out. So he blows them out, and he just throws them up on top of the culvert right up there, you know, in the grass. And we're lighting them, and then we smell something. We kind of look at each other. They keep getting blown out. We've thrown several up there. And we look up, and there's this little fire started. I mean, it's only just, you know, just this little fire. So, of course, in our, 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 I've already shown you how intelligent we are at this point, right? how, how far our logic uh, extends at this point. So we think, well, we got to put this thing out. So how do you put it out? Well, at that point, you know, I, the most, uh, I've, the, the fire I've had the most experience with is like birthday candles. And how do you put out a birthday candle? You blow on it, right? So we start blowing on this fire. 
Now, anybody that started a fire knows that's not how you put out a fire. That's how you start a fire, <sighs> by feeding it oxygen, right, and helping it to spread. You ever lit a campfire? So we're blowing on it, it keeps getting bigger. Well, you just blow harder. <sighs> you got bigger. Well, let's get all three of us over here. We'll all start blowing on it. Next thing I know, I mean, this thing's started, it's over the culvert, and it's obvious it's getting out of hand. And we have no idea what to do. So we go taking off, running over to the pole barn, which is just across this little creek. And my dad, he tells a story later, he saw us coming and he said, I just knew, just, I just took one look at you guys and I just knew that something had gone horribly wrong. And I'm running over there, I'm like, don't tell my dad. Tell my Uncle Chuck, tell my Uncle Chuck. So we go over and he's watching us tell my Uncle Chuck and Chuck gets this look on his face and he's going, Chuck, Chuck, what is it? And he's like, they lit the field on fire. So, you know, what happens next is, uh, you know, it's just, uh, when you reimagine things, you know, this is all taking place in the mind of the child. If this is exactly how I, it went down, I don't know. But I remember we all ran back over there. And I remember just seeing my dad with like a big green army blanket, like trying to put out flames taller than him. Like this thing had just taken off. And I don't know, maybe my, my, my child, the brain exaggerates this part, but I remember it getting all the way over, had gotten all the way over to this little two, two lane road. And the flames are like licking the, somebody's car that's going by and they're rolling up their window and I can hear the fire engines coming. And my dad just turns and goes, you, you three go, go back to the house and sit on the porch and stay there until I get there. And he was mad, obviously. So we go, back, we go back over the overpass and we're going past our elementary school. And by this time, the fire's gotten so out of control, so many fire trucks have gone by that uh, my, principal and my uh, principal and a few teachers had come out of the church, or not the church, the uh, school, and we're watching, and they took one look at us. And they said, come here. <laughs> and we got called in the principal's office. And uh, next thing I know, like they got the fire put out. Nothing bad happened. It, wasn't, it didn't get too out of control. No one got hurt or anything. But uh, I remember being in the principal's office, and this, this fireman, I don't know if he was the fire chief or whatever, but I mean, he just full get up. Comes in and just starts scolding us. The parents all get called there. My two friends are just crying, like just, ah, you know. And I remember, I didn't shed a tear. You know, maybe that's, maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. But I remember, because I, I wanted to be a fireman when I was a little kid. And I just remember thinking, this is so cool. I mean, like, I'm third or fourth grade. I'm like, I had to see fire trucks. There's a real fireman. You're like, I was just excited about the fact that there was a fireman. And then, uh, I'll end the story, but my dad, he basically, you know, he's, he's being real stern. And he takes me home. And he's, he's like, you stay in this room and don't come out until I get back. And I'm thinking, great. He's back in 45 minutes. Like, hey, buddy, how you doing? I'll look for you in the news tonight. That's what he said. That was it. That's all. That's, that was my punishment. 45 minutes in my bedroom. And it uh, did me a lot of good. But uh, I remember th the real punishment was in, like the next day, that weekend, I went to find Chris and Troy, and they're both grounded for like two weeks. I'm, the next day, I'm knocking on the door. Hey, you want to go ride bikes or whatever? They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, what? And they're like, we're grounded, man. I can't leave the house for two weeks. I was like, what? And that was kind of a punishment in itself. My best friends were we're gone. But I asked my dad years later, you know, when I was an adult, I said, why did you, why did you take it so easy on me? And he's like, he said, my dad had me burn that same field down on purpose all the time. He said, I'd go over there with a can of gasoline and, and burn it up just so we could con you know, control burn. He's like, and nothing really that bad happened. So I didn't make the news if you're wondering, but uh, that was it, you know, and he just, so I told that big long story because it's a fun story to tell. It's kind of amusing. And this is one of those sermons. And, but it goes to show you that just because somebody is lighting a fire, you know, doesn't necessarily make them an arson. Sometimes there are accidents, right? Now, I will close by saying this, that committing arson, you know, we've seen that it, it's, it's a very serious thing this morning. And actually, in this, and this is kind of what inspired this whole sermon. Someone was, it, had expressed this to me, and I thought, boy, that'd make a good sermon, maybe, depending on who's preaching it. But it says, uh, committing arson is actually something in Arizona that, that could get you shot and killed. Uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer, okay? So you want to just don't, you can't just go plugging people every time they go to light up a Marlboro or something and say, well, you know, Brother Corbett said they were, I thought he was an arsonist. So I saw the bick, you know, and next thing I know, I'm just had him in my sights. But under ARS 13 411, Arizona permits the use of force when preventing the commission of certain serious crimes. And I really don't want to go over all those crimes because some of them are quite serious. But uh, actually, let's go over it. I mean, we live in Arizona, right? We, we should, maybe it'd be good to know the law. He says, Arizona has specific self-defense laws that apply to preventing the commission of some serious crimes. In these limited scenarios, you can use a reasonable degree of physical uh, force 
even deadly force when it's reasonably and immediately necessary. Now you have to keep that in mind when you're deciding I'm going to use deadly force. You have to make, make sure that you're going to be able to back up the fact that it was reasonable. Okay, that's kind of a, a vague term. You know, there's some, that's, a, that's a very subjective term. What you might consider reasonable, another person you know, might not. Well, they were 400 yards away and they were headed right for me. So I dialed them in, you know, and I checked the windage, you know, and I got them right between the eyes. That's not reasonable, right? And you know, when they're within striking distance and they have a knife, that we have to use our common sense here. But he says, uh, to apply, you must uh, be in a place you are lawfully allowed to be. Also, you must reasonably believe that the force of level of force being uh, uh, force used is necessary to prevent the following specific crimes: armed robbery, ar aggravated assault. Uh, I want to put this delicately: um, carnal crimes. Those of you that know what I'm talking about. Uh, burglary, arson, kit so arson right there. That's what I was trying to get at. Arson is on that list. You know, if you see somebody, uh, you know, if one of you went out to step out for an instance to use the bathroom and you see a guy come around the corner with, you know, a, a gallon of gasoline or whatever and he's l pouring on the front door and getting ready to put a torch to it, you have, it's within your legal right to plug that guy. You know, if you see somebody starting to start a fire in an apartment building where there's people in it, you know, quite frankly, I think it's your civic duty to put that person away as quickly as possible to get them to stand down and stop what they're doing because they're going to kill and hurt a lot of people. So that's something we should, you know, maybe that's something some of these, <laughs> these uh, rioters should think about. Well, that, you know, at least here in the state of Arizona, that if someone knows the law well enough, you know, and is in the right set of circumstances, see them start to, well, I'm just going to light this car on fire. You could get shot. You can get shot and killed over that, and they would be legal to do so. And not to mention all these other things here. And, you know, and if, and if, there, if rioters are, gonna, are going to be going around and lighting fires to buildings that could potentially pee pee, uh, kill people and hurt people, and they end up catching a bullet for it, you know what I say? So be it. That's my opinion. If someone's going to take the risk of killing innocent people just to express their anger, just to express their rebellion, and they're shot, then so be it. I'd rather see that person go down than a perfectly innocent person who had nothing to do with it. And I think, you know, that's a very reasonable thing to say. But, you know, what do we get out of the sermon this morning? You know, the arson is bad, don't do it. Yeah, I think we all... I don't think anyone in the room this morning is struggling with arson, okay? But here's one thing we could take away from it. If the importance of teaching fire safety to your children, you know... I'm a perfect example of that. <laughs> Someone should have taken the time to explain to me that you don't throw lit matches in tall, gr dry grass, son. It just doesn't work. You know, teach them the, uh, the importance of fire safety and respecting the property of others. You know, they should learn to respect the property of others. That's the problem a lot of these rioters have is they don't, they were never taught to respect other people's property. They just think everything's theirs for the taking and they can damage whatever they want and it doesn't matter. Whether it's, you know, arson or tagging things or graffiti or just, you know, just, just treating other things, p other people's other things poorly. We should learn to respect other people's property, you know, at the very least. Not to mention we shouldn't light it on fire, right? I think that goes without saying. And here's the thing, we should teach these type of things to our kids and learn them ourselves because, you know, they could keep us from serious harm, you know, or from harming others. Let's go ahead and pray.